Shabbat Shalom and welcome to Beth Zion Messianic Synagogue in Jackson, New Jersey. I'm Rabbi Jan Rosenberg and this is Shabbat Online, our special online Shabbat service. I hope you're having a great week. We're glad you decided to join us today for this time of worship and the word. Marlene has joined me once again as we begin our worship with the traditional Jewish prayers. So let's draw near to the Lord and bless his name together. Baruch Hu et Adonai HaMevorach Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Le'olam Ma'ed Blessed be the Lord who is blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Messiah was asked the question, Rabbi, what is the most important command? He answered with the words of the Shema and said the following. And you shall love the, the Lord, Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Messiah then said, The second command is like unto the first, the Ahafta Lerecha Kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's right. I know that people are feeling down a bit these days as we look in the news and see all the things that are happening. But as we praise the Lord and as we worship him, he said, the word says that God inhabits the praises of his people. Our lips shall sing the praises of the Lord because God is the glory and the lifter of our head. This version of You're My Glory is with my wife, Marlene, and my daughter, Shoshana. It's in Hebrew, English, and Spanish. So join with us as we allow God to lift our hearts and lift our heads and experience his blessing as we worship him. My lips shall sing the praises of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From this time forth and forevermore. Shall sing of your praise. My mouth shall declare the glory of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From this time forth and forevermore. Shall declare your glory, you're my glory, and the lifter of my head, you're my glory, and the lifter of my head, you're my glory, and the lifter of my head. 
mis labios cantarán las alabanzas del Señor desde hoy en día y para siempre. Desde hoy en día y para siempre, mis labios cantarán su alabanza. Tú eres mi gloria y Él que levanta mi cabeza. Eres mi gloria y Él que levanta mi cabeza. Eres mi gloria y Él que levanta mi cabeza. Tiranena sefatai tehilot Hashem. Nevorach meata veadolam. Nevorach meata veadolam. Ufi agit ilatecha. people are struggling today with a lot of challenges. And Yeshua said, in this world, you'll have tribulation. But he also said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And he gave a remedy. He gave a simple remedy for dealing with all of the struggles and all of the challenges that we have. He puts the burden all on him. He said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We're going to sing this song called come near to me. And in all the challenges that there are, God always brings the victory and he will do it in your life as well. Let's worship the Lord as he draws near. Open your heart and let him come in and fill you to overflowing. In Yeshua's name. <laughs> Joseph's brothers were wrong, they skinned and they lied Sold him to slavery and thought he had died Until the day when he stood by their side and said Come near to me, sons of Jacob Come near to me, though you have gone astray He said, come near to me, sons of the things that you plan to do for evil, God has now turned for good. In temple days, when things got corrupt, there rose up a family by the name of Tzadok. 
They did what was right and never gave up So God said, come near to me Sons of Tzadok Come near to me Go others may go astray When Haman decided to kill every Jew And Mordechai told his cousin the news She went to the king, put her life on the line He stretched for the scepter and did not decline But said, come near to me My queen Esther Come near to me Tell me what can I do for you She said deliverance for every Jew It seemed like Haman's little plan was through Oh God says come near to me You who are burdened Come near to me And I will give you rest He said come near to me Continue our worship with the words of the Kaddish. If you're mourning the loss of a loved one, please stand at this time as we recite the Kaddish. Yitgadal v'yitgadal shimei raba Ba'mal divra kirute v'yamlich malchute V'chai echon v'yom echon U'v'chai edokol beit Yisrael Pagala uves man karif v'yemeru amen yesh me raba mevorach le'ala me ame amaya yiborach yiborach v'yishtabach v'yipuar v'yitraman v'yitnase v'yitadar v'yitale v'yitalo Shemedu kudisho berichu Lelamen kaber chata Veshirata Tush bechata venechemata Damiram bealma Vimeru amen Yehesh lama rabba min shemaya Vechayim olena v'yako Yisrael Vimeru Amen. O se shalom bimrumav, hu ya se shalom aleinu, ve ya kol Yisrael, vimru, vimru Amen. Ya se shalom, ya se shalom, Shalom aleinu ve'ako Yisrael Yase shalom, yase shalom Shalom aleinu ve'ako Yisrael Baruch Hashem We will recite the Kaddish in English. We include the bracketed words, which are from an ancient Sephardic rabbinical custom, corresponding to the words V'yatzma, Purka Neva, Karev, Meshicheh, Make his salvation to spring forth and bring near the Messiah. He is the center of everything. And he is the one who brings his peace to us. And so this is a word not of mourning and not of loss, but of magnifying and sanctifying the name of the Lord. When it says all everybody join in together, and let's keep in prayer all those who have suffered loss this week and keep those families in prayer. Magnified and sanctified be his great name in the world which he created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom and make his salvation to spring forth 
and bring near the Messiah in your lifetime and in your days, and during the life of the whole house of Israel, speedily, yes, soon, and say, Amen. Let his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity. Blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honored, magnified, and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed be he, though he be high above all the blessings and hymns, praises, and consolations which are uttered in the world, and say, Amen. May there be abundant peace from heaven and life for us and for all Israel, and say, Amen. May he who makes peace in his high places make peace for us and for all Israel, and say, Amen. May the Lord comfort all those who mourn in Zion and Jerusalem. May you bring your hand of blessing upon each family and each member who has suffered loss. We ask you to bring your comfort and your peace. We pray for loved ones who are ill and ask you to raise them up, to bring healing and deliverance, whatever that deliverance may require, whether it's physical healing, financial, emotional, spiritual, relational, marital. Stretch forth your hand, your mighty hand to save, and send forth your creative word and bring deliverance for each one in need. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem as we do each week, for the nation of Israel, that you would continue to bring your plan about in that region. It is tied to the redemption of the world. And we thank you, O oh God, that so many thousands of years ago, you established that city and that nation as the apple of your eye, as a gateway for all nations of the earth to be blessed through Messiah who came through the Jewish people. We thank you, O oh God, for your blessings. We pray for our nation here and for all nations that are in turmoil. Lord, you are the only one who can resolve these issues. You are the only one who can bring transformation to the hearts of people. You said nothing can separate us from the love of God. Through Messiah, we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. And Lord, we ask you to bring our country together. Bring your peace and unity and restoration. We thank you for your peace from on high, your peace for us and for all Israel and for all nations for all who call upon you, for all who call upon you in truth. B'Shem Sar Shalom, in the name of our Prince of Peace, Yeshua, HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah. And everyone agreed by saying Amen and Amen. You may be seated. Again, Shabbat Shalom, we welcome you to Beth Zion, where we are declaring Messiah to the Jewish heart of central Jersey and sharing the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes. We really believe that in putting the message of Yeshua back into the original Jewish context, people are able to understand the depth of intimacy that God wants us to know. And so we share with Jewish and non-Jewish alike, God has torn down the middle wall of partition, and we are one in Him. And we're grateful for that. You know, my favorite prophecy in the Scripture to Abraham when God said, in Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Today, these days, people are trying to figure out how to segregate and separate the tribes of this world. But God said that in Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And there is a secret formula for bringing unity. When we put him first, and when we understand Yeshua in his original Jewish context, the reality of what he has purchased for all people from all nations comes into light and the darkness has to flee because God is bringing restoration. His heart is to restore and to bring reconciliation between us and him and us and one another. So we're thankful for that opportunity. We try to present, as you'll see in the message, uh, from both the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, and the Burt Hadashah, the New Covenant, uh, all of the connecting points that are so vital for understanding that this is a plan of redemption and salvation that goes back from the beginning, God desiring to live and walk in union with His people. God wants to court you. He wants to, and if He could use the term date you, He wants to make Himself known to you. And as we open up our hearts to him, he will not disappoint. He'll make himself known. He will draw near and make himself known to us. 
we are going to move forward into our time in the Word. And before we do, uh, we have a couple of quick announcements. Uh, if you would like more information about Beth Zion, you can write us at info at bethzion.org. And uh, you can also send us your prayer requests and other contact information if you want to send us an encouraging word. We will be glad to receive that. Uh, if you would like to bring an offering, uh, you can do that through the donation button. And uh, just press that and it'll bring you to where you can do that through PayPal or credit card or debit card. If you would like to mail in your tithes and offerings, you can do that to Beth Zion, P.O. Box 807, Jackson, New Jersey, 08527. And we're grateful for that. We are a congregation that believes in Hamaser Vahaturumah, the tenth, the tithes and the offering. If you're visiting from another congregation, of course, your tithe goes to your congregation. And especially at this time when a lot of congregations aren't meeting, your congregation definitely needs you to continue sending in your tithes. So I encourage you to do that. If you want to bring an offering to us as well, we appreciate it. And uh, thank you for that. We thank everyone for your support in prayer, in finances, uh, and in every way, uh, as we are, again, sharing the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes. And like bubbies all over the world are known to say, write me sometime. If it's not too inconvenient, no Jewish guilt, but we love to hear from you. So without any further ado, we're going to get into our message for today. I'm going to start off by reading a passage from the Torah portion and a passage from the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant, as part of the message, and we won't be including the blessings this week. So, let's start. From Bamidbar, Numbers 1537, it says this, Hashem said to Moshe, Speak to the people of Israel, instructing them to make through all their generation tzitzot, fringes, on the corners of their garments, and to put with its tzitzit on each corner a blue thread. It is to be a tzitzit for you to look at and thereby remember all of Hashem's mitzvot, all His commands, and obey them so that you won't go around wherever your own heart and eyes lead you to prostitute yourselves. But it will help you remember and obey all my mitzvot and be holy for your God. I am Hashem, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt in order to be your God. I am Hashem, your God. And from Dr. Luke, the book of Luke, in the Birch Hadashah, the New Covenant, chapter 8, beginning in verse 40. When Yeshua got back, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then there came a man named Yair, who was president of the synagogue. Falling at Yeshua's feet, he pleaded with him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. As he went with the crowds on every side virtually choking him, a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone came up behind him and touched the tzitzit on his robe. Instantly her hemorrhage stopped. Her hemorrhaging stopped immediately. Yeshua asked, who touched me? When they all denied doing it, Kepha, Peter, said, Rabbi, the crowds are hemming you in and, uh, and jostling you. But Yeshua said, Someone did touch me because I felt power go out of me. Seeing she could not escape notice, the woman, quaking with her fear, threw herself down before him and confessed in front of everyone why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. He said to her, My daughter, 
Your trust has saved you. Go in peace. Lord, we thank you for the reading of these two portions. We ask you to open up our hearts to the message you have for us today. We thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. In today's portion entitled Shlach Lecha, or Send on Your Behalf, beginning in chapter 13 of Bamidbar, Numbers, God instructs Moses to send, to pick out men, one leader from each tribe, to send them in to reconnoitre or spy out the land of promise. And it's important because he says, the land that I am giving you. And he told them to go into the land, and they did. They selected important leaders from each tribe, and they sent them to go in. And he said he wanted to know, to find out this. He said, see what the land looks like. He said, see if it's strong or weak, few or many, good or bad, open or fortified, fertile or unproductive in the land, and bring back some fruit samples as well. This is what they did. And for 40 days, they went out to reconnoitre the land, to check it all out and to see what it was going to be. And the title for this message is, Are You Part of a Fringe Group? Are you part of a fringe group? As we noticed last week, there was some complaining and bickering and uh, accusations being brought forth by people. There was rebellion. There were other things. I guess you could call it protesting. People were protesting because they weren't getting what they wanted and they thought they deserved more. And so they did that. Well, this week continues that. In fact, this whole section of the book of Bamidbar is filled with these kinds of rebellious examples, the protests that happened from fringe groups, groups that were on the edge. They wanted to go back. They wanted to do things. They didn't know what was happening. When challenges came, they were uncertain. Well, they went into the land. They came back and brought their report and everything looked fine. They, they brought back the fruit. It was wonderful. It looked great. Grapes coming in from Eshkal. And what they decided to do was to bring a report that was negative. They brought back word to them, and the entire community showed up and saw the fruit. They said that this was a place, well... Let's put it this way. Caleb silenced the people around Moshe and said, we ought to go up immediately and take possession of it. There's no question we can conquer it. He knew that because he saw what God had done before. God already established a track record of conquering things that were impossible. They all saw this. And yet as soon as something came that looked difficult, they began to protest. They began to fight back. There's no question we can conquer it. But the men who had gone with him said, we can't attack those people because they're stronger than we are. And they spread a negative report about the land they had reconnoitered for the people of Israel. And they said, the land we pass through in order to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. All the people we saw there were giant. We saw the Nephilim, the sense of Anak, who was from the Nephilim. To ourselves, we looked like grasshoppers by comparison, and so we looked that way to them too. Sometimes we can look at circumstances and really not know exactly what's going on. It isn't always as it appears. We look later on uh, and see that Forty years later, we'll see that when we see what happens in the book of Joshua. But I want you to keep this in mind. They looked like grasshoppers in their own sight. What were they doing? They were looking at their inadequacy. They were looking at themselves and figuring out that they didn't have the capacity to move into what God said was theirs. They didn't look at the power of what God was providing they only saw their inadequacy. And so they demoralized 
the people by their negative report. Their protest grew exponentially and all of them were weeping and all of them were in such rebellion. And then it says this. They said to the whole house of the land we passed through in order to spy out as an outstandingly good land. If God is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Just don't rebel against Hashem. And don't be afraid of the people living there. We'll eat them up. I'll tell you, Caleb and Joshua had a very clear understanding of who they were serving and who was in their camp, in their corner. Their defense has been taken away from them. The Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. You know, sometimes uncertainty brings out fear, the fear of the unknown. And when that happens, we begin to panic. We begin to try to take things into our own hands. You know, it's interesting. I, I can't help but mentioning this as a, an interesting parallel for what we're seeing all around us. You know, I understand that people have suffered problems, have suffered from others, have suffered discrimination, have suffered physical harm and all of those things. But there is also a solution that is beyond human understanding. What tends to happen when people begin to be uncertain and begin to de be demoralized, they begin to dehumanize everything around them. One of the things I find interesting is that these complaints were more than just complaints. You know, we can bring challenge. In fact, all of the prophets challenged kings all the time. They had audience with kings. They had audience with people in political power. And we are to speak truth to power. But if it is in a place of uncertainty, looking at ourselves as having been disadvantaged, seeing ourselves as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight, rebelling and all of that, look what it went down to. God had given them a law, he had given them the Torah, and he said it would be a blessing for them. But in chapter 14 of Numbers, verse 10, it said, But just as the whole community were saying these things, they said we should stone him to death. Isn't it interesting how it moved towards violence? It moved towards violence. And it was out of an emotional reaction to thinking that they were inadequate and unable to handle the challenges laid before them. And so I find it also fascinating that Moses' response, I mean, he's the one they wanted to stone. They not only wanted to go back to Egypt, which was totally crazy, because while we said last week it says, but we had leeks and garlic, we had fish, at no cost, at no cost. They were slaves. They had no life. And yet, the deception that developed from their complaint turned into protest and turned into a violent show to where they were ready to stone Moses. Maybe it was bricks. Maybe it was Molotov cocktails. Probably not. But the point is, it moves as a natural tendency. When people are uncertain, they begin to move into other areas. Some may have had ulterior motives. Maybe some of the mixed multitude wanted to go back to Egypt. Maybe this life seemed too hard. But God had made a promise and he was going to bring it through. And I find this fascinating. Moses did not take the bait in this case. He said, however, Moses replied in verse 13 to the Lord, when the Egyptians hear about this, because God said, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm tired of these people. They've aggravated me and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start a whole new group with you. Moses intercedes for the people who wanted to stone him. I think that's pretty amazing because he caught the vision and God was allowing him opportunity to be able to step forward. And he says, when the Egyptians hear about this 
and they will, they'll say God was unable to bring them into the land which he swore to give them. So now please let the Lord's power be as great as when you said, Hashem is slow to anger, rich in grace, forgiving offenses and crimes. Please, he said, forgive the offense of this people according to the greatness of your grace, just as you have borne this people from Egypt until now. And it's also interesting that just a little bit further in chapter 15, just going quickly over some of these things, it says, for this community, there will be the same law for you as for the foreigner living with you. This is a permanent regulation throughout your generations. The foreigner is to be treated the same way before Hashem as yourselves. The same Torah and standard of judgment will apply to both you and the foreigner living with you. He also talked about if there were sins by mistake, God made provision for them to return. But he also understood that individuals who do wrong intentionally, whether citizens or foreigners, are blaspheming Hashem. And that person will be cut off, not because God wants to cut them off, but because their actions cut them off from the community. Their actions move away from reasoning together to a place of protest turning into violence. Now, I'm not implying that all of protests are violent and a problem. But we need to keep our sechel, we need to keep our wisdom, our, 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 our way of thinking. And so he goes through all of this and watching over and over again how Israel continually was aggravating God, if you will, and rebelling and complaining and protesting because they weren't getting what they wanted. There comes to the end of chapter 15, verse 37, the passage we read earlier, where God instructs Moses to speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make throughout their generations tzitziot, tzitzit, fringes, on the corners of their garments, and to put at the corner of each fringe a thread of blue. And it'll be for a fringe, you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them so that you won't go around with your own heart and your own eyes leading you astray. And this translation says, leading you to prostitute yourselves. In, inevitably, as there is a drawing back from the commands of God, from the regulations laid out, from looking to walk in harmony with what God had laid out as his precepts, as he mentioned, precepts that were forever, permanent, regulations, permanent regulations for the foreigner and for the citizen. He gives them this way of looking at it, having these fringes. And so here was a nation wearing tzitziot, wearing fringes. The world around would look and say, who are these people? Are they all royalty? They are a holy nation? And people would then say, these are the people who God delivered out of slavery, out of Egypt, and brought them to their own land. These are the people who walk in union with God. That was the plan. But they strayed from it. And the fringes were a reminder, not, somebody asked me one time, why do you wear those fringes, those tassels hanging from your fur? And I said, well, they're not tassels. Are, is that something to make you righteous? I said, well, in actuality, there were a reminder that left to ourselves, we are not righteous. Left to ourselves, we go astray. And so it's a reminder, like tying a string around your finger, to obey God, to remember what he said, so that we would have less likelihood to forget and go astray. Also interesting that when it came to the challenges that Israel met in the land, it was challenges that were based on idolatry, and often the avenue for entrance into idolatry started with the temple prostitutes. They would lure them in. They would seduce them. They would get them involved in a sexual practice that tied them to these idol gods. You know, it's interesting that the morality all around begins to slip 
And what happens is we distance ourselves from the lover of our soul. We distance ourselves away from him. And it was a reminder. And, you know, maybe somebody would look and say, oh, that's some kind of Hittite. Oh, oh, is she cute? I'd like to go sleep with her. And then realize as somebody walked by and the tzitzis below me in the wind said, no, 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 I can't compromise the commands of God. God has done so much for me. But maybe he went a little further. Maybe he went out on a date and he's with her now and he has to go past the tzitzis to do the deed. It's a reminder, don't do it because it's a slippery slope. These are part of God's cords of mercy that draw us back to himself. And you know, those fringes represented healing. It represented wholeness. It represented the white fringes and the blue thread, the techelet, that it's, as it's called in Hebrew, that was weaved throughout those knots that represented the commands of God. God's presence interwoven in between every aspect of our life. It was a representation of the holiness of God not necessarily the holiness of ourselves, but a calling to holiness that God gave us and a reminder not to stray. Well, you know, during Yeshua's time, and we see this story, as I mentioned before, in Luke 8, where Yeshua was welcomed by the crowds. You know, that's another thing. Sometimes people will welcome you and men will put you on a pedestal, set you up, and later chop you out at the knees. People and men are fickle. But here was a good point. The crowds welcomed him. They were all expecting him, and he came to them. And, and this man, the president of the synagogue, Yair, fell at Yeshua's feet, and he pleaded with him to come to his home. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. You know, the judgment that happened for Israel was that when they said, they can't go in. God's punishment to them was that the 40 days that they searched out the land and the 40 days that they came back with a negative report meant that Israel would wander in the wilderness for 40 years. The connection was to cover a span of time of completion. Under challenge, God was bringing deliverance. But here we have an interesting story because this woman had an issue of blood and a, a, a hemorrhaging issue for 12 years. She spent all her money on doctors trying to figure out what to do. Couldn't find an antidote. Couldn't find a vaccine. <laughs> I guess there is no vaccine for that. But she spent all her time trying to And then she heard Yeshua was there and she went forward and came from behind and touched his tzitzit. It represented the presence of God, and he felt virtue go forth. He felt something, and he said, someone touched me. Kiva said, hey, everybody's choking you in all around you. It's, it's all faklemt here. Nobody can move. We're crowded on every side. You felt something? <laughs> Rabbi, the crowds are hemming in and jostling you. It wasn't anything about touching. Yeshua said, someone did touch me because I felt the power go out of me. Seeing she could not escape, notice the woman, quaking for fear, threw herself down before him and confessed in front of everyone why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. His response to her fear, now think about this, they feared being devoured by the people in the land that God promised them. Their fear overtook their faith. Here, her fear of being disclosed, she wasn't sure if it was proper to do what she did. But she comes forward and in fear, she comes before him and she confessed what she had done and how she had been instantly healed. Now here is one of those surprises that she got. Yeshua said to her, my daughter, your trust has saved you. Go in peace. Your trust has saved you. Go in peace. Now, this is kind of interesting, too, because I mentioned before about the 40 days and 40 years. 
But there was something interesting about periods of time. Twelve years is a long time as well. This man, Yair, had a daughter who was dying. She was 12 years old. During that same time span, 12 years, this woman had a hemorrhaging problem that could not be healed. And God healed her. Then he got word that Yair's daughter died. And he said, keep trusting. She's asleep. Many couldn't see it. They disbelieved the possibility of what could happen. But in fact, to make a long story short, she also was healed, raised from the dead. It's never too late for God to move in what looks like it's impossible. We're living in a time when things seem to be so out of control. But we can't go by appearances. You know, it's funny that in the book of Joshua, Joshua 2, which is the Haftorah portion, it mentions the same 40-year period, only now Moses sends two spies into the land so that they wouldn't be talking among themselves and bringing negative reports. Spy out the land. Find out what is going on there. And what was amazing to find out was this, that not just recently, but for the last 40 years, when Israel came out of Egypt and defeated Sihon and Og, and these others who came out to attack them, all of these stories circulated throughout Jericho and throughout the land of Canaan. And the woman who brought the spies in, <laughs> she said, everyone has been depressed for 40 years. They knew that they were next, only they probably didn't know it was 40 years. They were under anguish for 40 years. The people who had already passed away said, these people were giants, they'll devour us. Caleb said, we'll eat them up. They believed not because of their own ability, but they believed because God said it. And Caleb believed it. And God proved himself again to be faithful. You see that later on unfold. But there we have it, unable to see what was going on. And all this time they spent 40 years dying in the wilderness because of their unbelief. But here, this woman, because of her faith, because of her trust, experienced the blessing of God. Now, you know, it mentions also in chapter 6 of Mark that they were coming back from an event and it says, come with me by yourself. This is chapter 6, verse 31, to a place where you can be alone and you can get some rest, refreshing. And they went off by themselves to an isolated spot. There are times when we need to isolate ourselves, not because there's a mandate that says we need to close ourselves into our homes, but there's something special about finding a place alone and quiet before God. It says, but many people seeing them leave and recognizing them ran ahead of them and got there first. And Yeshua was moved with compassion and he healed them. He also provided miraculously. Again, something that didn't seem as it appeared. Or it says, they were hungry and he said, Send the people away, they said. Tomadim, the disciples said. Send them away so that they can go and buy food for themselves in the farms and towns all around. Made sense. He had 5,000 people. Who's going to be able to feed 5,000 people? They said after giving him their understanding and estimate of what they did, they reconnoitred the land there. And their assessment was that we have no way to feed that many people. He said to them, Give them something to eat yourselves. They replied, We're to go and spend thousands on bread and give it to them to eat? He asked, How many loaves do you have? Go and check. They came back, they had five loaves and two fish. Miraculously, he set them down in groups of fifties and hundreds, and everyone was served, everyone ate, and there was 12 baskets full. 
of leftovers for those late nights. Amazing. God had done something miraculous. After this went on, it says that they went into a ship and they went across and while they were in the boat, they saw Yeshua walking on the water. <laughs> Pretty impossible, huh? But you know, after the crowd was done and after he had finished those things, they went on the ship and he stayed there, it says in verse 46. After he had left them, he went into the hills to pray. He didn't look for his PR clippings. He didn't look to get in front of a microphone and tell about what great things he did. He didn't go to see if people all got the details about how he, with very little, fed 5,000, how it was impossible, but he did it. He didn't look for accolades of men. He was simply ministering to them as he saw the Father working in his life. You know, we can go through all kinds of of systems and programs to try to fix and feed the hungry or fix and heal those in need. But God provides for us something much bigger than ourselves, bigger than our own programs. Anyway, it says, it says uh, after he went and prayed, it says, when the night came and they were about four o'clock in the morning, they were on the lake and they see him walking to them on the lake. They shrieked, there must be a ghost. They had all seen him and were terrified. However, he spoke to them these words. He said, courage. It's just me. Stop being afraid. It's me. Stop being afraid. What does that tell us? Their unbelief at seeing what they saw, which seemed impossible, caused them to shriek and in fear to be terrified. And he tells them, take courage. It's me. It is I. Stop being afraid. The wind ceased. They were astounded. And then after that, it says, just a few verses down in verse 53, after they had made the cross and they landed in Genosar and anchored, as soon as they got out of the boat, the people recognized him and began running around throughout the whole region and bringing sick people on their stretchers to any place where they heard he was. And interestingly, it says, wherever he went in towns and cities and country, they laid the sick in the marketplace. They begged him to let them touch even the tzitzit on his robe. And all who touched it were healed. Well, this was not like a prayer cloth saying there's an anointing on this. It wasn't the fringes that were magical. It wasn't that the fringes had healing power. What it represented was somebody submitted to the Father. It represented the holiness of God interwoven in every aspect of his life. It represented their hunger to reach out and take hold of those fringes and in so doing, take hold of God's mercy. You know, it's interesting how we react to things. We know what we want and we strive. You know, it's interesting that we always use the passage from, uh, from Vayakra Leviticus uh, 19, 18, where it says, love your neighbor as yourself. And people don't always know what that means. They think it means let everybody do whatever they want. It's not what it means at all. I'm not going to go into that now. But here's something interesting, I think, considering the days we're living. In Matthew's Yahu, Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, in verse 43 to 48, look at what Yeshua says. You've heard that our fathers were told, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Who was told that? Love your, your neighbor and hate your enemy. You won't find hate your enemy anywhere in the scripture. But there was this idea that if you love the people you know, you're fulfilling it. Your neighbor is the one who lives with you who's just like you. But that's not what it means because you had mixed multitudes that came in. And as long as they followed the precepts and the regulations that the Torah spoke of, they were welcome to participate. And not only were, if they didn't, were they 
removed. But if they were citizens, if they were Israelis, and they violated those things, they had to leave too. Because what was most important was, and I hate to use the term, law and order. But not law and order where people are usurping their authority over others, but law and order because God has a system for drawing people into a community. Everything was about the community. And look at what he says. He says to them, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. You know, this is none of the things that Yeshua spoke were meant to be something that we could do on our own. It's difficult to love an enemy. How do you pray for those who persecute you? Like the prayer from Tavia, when he said, is there a prayer for the czar? He said, may the Lord bless and keep the czar far away from us. <laughs> that was the line. But he wants us to pray for those who persecute us. Because I guarantee you that whatever the persecutors are doing, it's probably come out of their own pain and persecution that they experienced growing up. Not an excuse, but God is always pushing towards redemption. He says this, Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Then you will become children of your Father in heaven. You're not going tit for tat. You're not doing what they do and say, well, they started it and they did it first. That's children. It's not reality. And yet our emotions get stirred and when they do, we begin to complain, we begin to feel our gripes aren't being heard and we begin to take things into our own hands and it explodes into violent action. He says this, he makes his sun shine on good and bad people alike. And he sends rain to the righteous and the unrighteous alike. What reward do you get if you love only those who love you? Mutual admiration society? <laughs> Why, even tax collectors do that. And that was not a very popular category in those days of vocation, by the way. And if you are friendly only to your friends, are you doing anything out of the ordinary? Even the goyim, the nations, the Gentiles do that. Therefore, be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And what makes us perfect? That we think we're perfect? We know we're not perfect. But it's the idea that God brings the fringes of his presence. He brings us into not the fringe groups that rebel, not the fringe groups from the left or right that have their gripes that destroy everything in between, but the fringe group being tied to God, being united and knotted to Him, brings about a transforming factor into our lives. What reward do you have if you love only those who love you? People have a tribal mentality that now wants to segregate. Isn't it interesting that we fought for all those years for freedom for all people? to destroy and remove slavery, then to deal with the Jim Crow laws and to deal with segregation and to deal with all of that. And now today, the answer that people have is to segregate, choosing to segregate, choosing to isolate themselves instead of finding an avenue of resolution that would bring about change. As I mentioned before, God always had the formula for the nations. He said that in Abraham's seed, meaning Messiah, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. God is not calling us to take sides. God is not on the right or the left. We take his side. His side is to pray for those who persecute you, to pray for those who despitefully use you. All of these things. He says, we show by example. Yeshua said, they'll know you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. Now some might say, well, yes, I love my neighbor. I love the people who love me. No, that's not what he's saying. They'll know you're my disciples 
by the love you have for one another. What does that mean? That means there is a love that is demonstrated that goes beyond what normally people think love represents. And so they are able to experience and see what the love of God in people's lives represent. Now we're frail. We make mistakes, but God makes provision for us to return. You know, a lot of the issues, if you look at it, when protest begins and when violence bursts out, the concept is first over the idea of injustice and wanting to come up against the injustices that exist. And that is all throughout the scripture as well, the call to justice. But there is something more. What you'll notice is that when God brings judgment and God speaks of justice, he speaks of equal justice under his law. He says, justice, only justice you should seek. Justice is not mixed. It says in another place, you're not allowed to have two scales, only one. You're not allowed to have two ways of measuring, one for one group, one for another. You're not supposed to have, in the New Testament, he says this, he reiterates the same thing. He says, you don't give deference to the poor because they're poor or allow the rich to get their way by bribes. Justice is blind, not because it can't see, but because it's blind not to justice. Though these days, I think people's definition of justice seems to be blind to justice. Hatred and fear takes over and people become reactionary and they rebel against all of God's commands with lawlessness and with a mindset to destruction. But when God speaks of judgment, it's a wake-up call. It's a call to return, a call to be restored, a call to come back. It's interesting that you have the fringe groups on the left, the fringe groups on the right. We talk, they talk about systemic sin the systemic racism, but it's more than racism. It is systemic sin that is at the core and heart of the human condition. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God doesn't bring punishment and revenge as the answer to that. He has it as his formula for return. And I've said this over and over again. Look anywhere you want in the scripture and you'll find that with every judgment that is spoken about, there is an avenue of return that is made available to the people if they will take it. God is always looking to do that. And so many times, you say, why would God allow himself to be aggravated with people that he called and delivered such, and such by, by such a mighty hand? Why would he tolerate them? We know human beings wouldn't. Because God loves us with all of our faults, with all of our frailties, with all of our sin. He makes provision to cover our sin. The ultimate gift was Messiah laying his life down as a sacrifice for us. Took upon himself our sins so we could be delivered. In the message of redemption, the message of the scripture, when it comes to all these different things... It is a message of redemption, not revenge. It's a message of healing, of reconciliation, not segregation, not separation, not destroy your enemy. It's restoration, not destruction. There's an interesting passage I want to mention as I'm bringing this to a close. Interesting passage in the book of Matthew, chapter 11. When we go to this, I want you to think about this too because, you know, I've had people come to me for marriage counseling and after a little while I'm hearing, well, he always does this and not have it. She constantly, da, 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 whatever. And they're going back and forth and I would, I would ask them the question, are you trying to reconcile? Yes, we would like to reconcile. Okay. It sounds like you're trying to develop evidence to more effectively indict the other when you come to divorce because neither one is talking about trying to find resolution talking past each other 
they don't hear each other. And so it's important with every struggle and every challenge to find that place of rest, to find that place of connection, of commonality in our walk and our desire to be reconciled to each other. There are people that do have ulterior motives. And these things we see also. There is evil in the world. But if we don't maintain our our sechel, our sense, if we're drawn by our emotions in all these different directions, God is no longer in the equation and someone else is conducting control over us. It is a form of slavery. The slave master is Hasatan, the adversary. But I want you to listen to this for a bit. He went into these towns in chapter 11, Matthew, in verse 16. He went, he says, what do I compare this generation to? They're like children sitting in the marketplace, calling out to each other. We made happy songs, happy music, but you wouldn't dance. We made sad music, but you wouldn't cry. <laughs> I'm thinking about these occupied cities and stuff now. It's funny how there's music, there's dance, there's art, there's happy, there's sad. But there's no real connection to what's going on. And then here is the double standard that's in place. I mentioned before, not to have two scales. Well, listen, it says, For Yochanan came fasting, not drinking. So they said, he has a demon. Then the Son of Man came, eating and freely drinking wine. So they said, aha, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Well, the proof of wisdom is in the actions it produces. And when you look at what he did, he denounced these towns where he did his miracles. The people had not turned from their sins. The whole purpose of seeing people delivered was to also get them to understand that they could not do this themselves, that the human condition is desperately wicked. Who can know it? But God knows it and makes provision for us by his spirit to come and transform us. They say, we'll be exalted to the heavens. Really? No, you'll be brought down to Sheol. You know, he mentions that these other places, Sodom and Gomorrah and other places, uh, Tzor and Sidon, he says, they will speak against you in the day of judgment because if they had the opportunity, they would have taken it. It says, day of judgment, it will be more tolerable, more bearable for the land of Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, than for you. And then I want, to, I want to take a look at this. There's so much more we can say. You know, when we have challenges that happen, there's an interesting Talmudic passage. It says, those who are kind to the cruel will be cruel to the kind. People begin to devour one another. First, we have a common enemy that we want to destroy, to humiliate, to denigrate, to bring down. We talked about last week with the high priest when he was dressed and covered in dung and the accuser of the brethren was there continually, continually pouring, berating him with all of these self-worth issues. God cleaned him and made him to be an important person for the establishment of the Jewish nation. But under all that dung, it couldn't be seen. And when we are constantly heaping dung over people's lives, dehumanizing them, doing something that destroys, demoralizes. There is no productivity in that. There is a short-lived victory in having conquered your enemy. But there's something about winning your enemy that is so much better. And that's what Yeshua was speaking of when he said to pray for those who persecute you. You know, when we look at people like tortured for Christ, when we look at what that man in prison did, persecuted by his jailers, and he continually showed them love and prayed for them. Many of them came to know the Lord because they saw a love that was different than they had ever seen before. We need to be able to demonstrate that with people. To hear the pain, to hear the trouble, to weep with those who weep, 
but to find and show that there is an avenue of return. And this, I think, is fascinating. He said, you've never heard God's voice or seen his shape. Moreover, his word does not stay in you because you don't trust the one who he sent. He says, you keep examining the Tanakh, the scriptures, because you think that in it you have eternal life. You can be a self-righteous person who knows everything about God's word and not be walking in harmony with his word. Those very verses bear witness to me, but you won't come to me in order to have life. Think about this. It says, he came to me, wept over Jerusalem. It says, I would have done for you, and you would not respond. He is always making opportunity for there to be reconciliation and healing. He says, I don't collect praise, verse 41 of chapter 5 of Yochanan John. I don't collect praise for men, but I do know you people. I know that you have no love for God in you. I've come in my Father's name and you don't accept me. If someone else comes in his own name, him you'll accept. How can you trust? You're busy collecting praise from each other instead of seeking praise from God only. You don't think that is I who would be your accuser. And he says Moses will do that. All of life's actions, all of the reality will be the accuser. Not to destroy, but to bring a final judgment. And we don't want to be in that place. He says it's a matter of trust. Matter of trust. You know, there are other strings and chords. There's a passage in Jeremiah 31 where it says, with chords of mercy, he will draw us to himself. There was an interesting passage. It says, we'll come before kings in Isaiah, in Psalm 119. Um, but there's a passage which says, even when the chords of the wicked close around me, I don't forget your Torah. I don't forget your word, your law. That was verse 61 of Psalm 119. All of these things, there are cords of the wicked that try to bind us and paralyze us to put us in chains and in bondage. But God wants to break every chain, break every yoke, and set the captives free. And what do you do when you see somebody caught in sin? When you see somebody doing something wrong? Galatians 6 says this, Brother, suppose someone is caught doing something wrong. You who have the Spirit should set him right. Restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Tempted in what he's doing? No, tempted in judging in a way that doesn't come from the place of restore. Maybe looking for vengeance. Maybe looking to point out their sin. They already know their sin. But pointing out that there's an avenue of return. He says, humility. Keeping an eye on yourself so that you won't be tempted. Bear one another's burdens. This is a good thing. You'll fulfill the law of Messiah, the true meaning of what his words say and uphold. Anyone thinks he is something when he is really nothing, he's fooling himself. There are so many people that are so pompous right now, trying to think they have all the answers, and their answers are always to tell you why the other one is wrong. That's not an answer. That's puffing yourself up and fooling yourself. Let each one scrutinize his own actions not having double standards, not having two weights of measure, not having cords that bind, but allowing the fringes, the tzitzis of God to come in and set us free. Are you part of a fringe group? <laughs> well, the only fringe group you should really be a part of is to be tied to the Lord in every way, tied to Him and experience His wonder, His glory. It says that we reap what we sow. Don't grow weary in well-doing, for in due time you will reap if you don't give up. Have courage. You know, in closing, in Matthew 11, it had those words, Come to me, all of you who are struggling and burdened, and I will give you rest. Isn't what we're really looking for is peace, is rest, is God's presence, his blessing. Isn't that what we're really looking for? Where does it come from? You struggle, you fight, you restrict, and you are depressed. 
and it turns to no productivity whatsoever. Short-lived victories that produce nothing. But God says, Yeshua said, come to me, all of you who struggle and are burdened, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He will yoke himself with us. He'll tie himself to us. He will carry the burden with us. He will show us how to have victory over every challenge that comes in our life and live in a victorious place in the foundation of his love. I am gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. Isn't that what we want? We want to stimulate continually anger and frustration and anguish over things that have seriously affected us? But is it to remain in that place or are we looking for rest in our soul? He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light and it will always produce blessings from God. He will always produce the things that make a difference. People who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. I will come to give rest to Israel. The Lord appeared in the past saying, I've loved you with an everlasting love and with loving kindness, I will draw you to myself. I will build you up again and you will be rebuilt. And that's not a political line to say, I will build you again. Why do we have to label everything as racist if it disagrees with us? God says, I will build you up again. I'll restore you and you will be rebuilt like the $6 million man, better than before. <laughs> well, anyway, I thank you for joining me at this time. And I want you to think about where your allegiance is. Where is your allegiance? Are you in a fringe group or are you wearing in spiritual sense, the fringes of God. Are you there always having available the reminder of how much God cares for you, how much he loves you, and how we can look to love one another? God has one law for citizens and foreigners, and it's one that welcomes people into the presence of the Lord, that in Abraham's seed and Messiah, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So I encourage you, I encourage you to take hold from, of, of what God has taken hold of you for, to give you a hope and a heritage, and something that will not make you ashamed. Lord, I thank you for all those listening and ask that you would have some of these words to speak deeply to the core of our being, that we would be transformed by your spirit, that we would see you come and bring your justice. Bring healing to those who are hurting. Bring comfort to those who are mourning. And bring restoration to those who have been neglected. Lord, help us to see you bring about. You said, can a nation be born in a day? Lord, in a moment, suddenly you can come and change everything. We sure can mess stuff up quickly, but Lord, you can also heal and deliver quickly as well. We ask you to help us work together, not talk past each other, hear each other's pain, but not live in pain, but experience to look up and know that our redemption draws near. We're going to close with Marlene joining us also for uh, some of the traditional blessings at the end of our service. We thank you for joining with us. We thank you for being with us each week. We're trying to speak from our heart with this and to bring a message of redemption. Revenge is so short-lived. Unforgiveness is a prison cell of its own. Forgiveness doesn't let the other person off the hook. It lets us off the hook so we can enter into rest and begin to do what we're called to do and not be sidetracked by an agenda placed upon us by our emotions or by other people. God wants us to love one another. 
so fulfill the law of Messiah. Join us again next week for Shabbat Online and uh, invite others to join in at bethzion.org forward slash live. You can listen to this message again. You can invite others to listen to it. And you can go back to previous broadcasts if you like as well. And uh, invite people. Let's spread the word. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds, and God is going to make a way where there seems to be no way. That's just what he does. He's got a great track record. He can be trusted. Don't be afraid. Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shavuot tov. Aleinu. It is for us to praise the Lord of all, to proclaim the greatness of the creator of the universe. We bend the knee, worship, and give thanks unto the King of kings, the Holy One, blessed be He. Yes. Aleinu l'shabeach l'adon hakol, l'atet k'dulo l'yotzer v'reshid, shelo asanu k'goye haratzot, v'lo samanu k'mishpechod hadoma, shelo sam chelkenu kahem, v'goraleinu, Kichol hamonam, vanachnu korim, umistachavim umodim, lifne melech, malke hamlachim, hakadosh baruchu. And it has been foretold, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord shall be one Amen. and his name one. Yes. Venemar. Ahaya Adonai, the Melacha call Haaretz. Vayomahu, Vayomahu, Ye Adonai Echad. Ushemao, Ushemao, Ushemao Echad. Ain Keloheinu. There is none like our God, our Lord, our King, and our Savior. Who is like our God, our Lord, our King, and our Savior? We will give thanks to our God, our Lord, King, and Savior. Blessed be our God, Lord, King, and Savior. You are our God, Lord, King, and Savior. You are the one to whom our ancestors burnt the fragrant incense. Ain Keloheinu, Ain Kadoneinu, Ain Kimalkeinu, Ain Kimoshienu, Mi Keloheinu, Mi Kadoneinu, Mi Kimalkeinu, Mi Kimoshienu, No del Eloheinu, No del Adoneinu, No del Imalkeinu, no de la Moshienu, Baruch Eloheinu, Baruch Adoneinu, Baruch Malkeinu, Baruch Moshienu, Atohu Eloheinu, Atohu Adoneinu, Atohu Malkeinu, Atohu Moshienu, Atohu Shitiru, Avoteinu, Lefanecha eketoret hasamim. Adon Olam. He is the eternal Lord who reigned before any being was created. And at that time, when all was made according to his will, he was at once acknowledged as king. And at that end of time, when all shall cease to be, the revered God alone shall still be king. He was, he is, and he shall be in glorious eternity. He is one, and there is no other to compare to him, to place beside him. He is without beginning and without end. Power and dominion belong to him. He is my God, my living redeemer. He's my stronghold in times of distress. He is my guide and my refuge, my share of bliss the day I call. To him I entrust my spirit when I sleep and when I wake. As long as my soul is within my body, the Lord is with me and I am not afraid. Wait. Adon Alam, Hashem Malach, 
Beterem kol yitzir nivra, le'et nasa bechevtso kol, azai melech shemo nikra ve'achare kivlot ha'kol. Levado yimloch nora, v'hu haya, v'hu have, v'hu yie, v'tifara, v'hu echad, v'ein sheni. Laham shilo, lahach bira, v'li reshit, v'li tachlit, v'lo haoz, v'ha mizra, v'hu eili, v'chai goali. V'tzor chevli, b'yei tzara, v'hu nisi, u'manos li, menat kosi, v'yom ekra, v'yado, avkid ruchi. V'yet ishan, v'ayira, v'yim ruchi, g'v'yavti, Adonai li, v'lo ira. As Aaron blessed the people of Israel, so we bless one another with these words. Yivarech echad enai v'yish marecha Yair Adonai panevelecha v'chunecha Yisa Adonai panevelecha V'yosem l'cha Shalom The Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'shem Sar Shalom, in the name of our Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for joining us for Shabbat Online. We look forward to seeing you next week. Shavua Tov. Have a great week. Shalom.